So now let me introduce our three panellists who are here. Uh, first speaker is going to be Jenny Aker, who's an assistant professor of development economics at Tufts and has been looking at the impacts of technology and especially mobiles on development, particularly in West and Central Africa. She's going to be followed by Ken Banks, who is the founder of Kiwanja Net and Frontline SMS and spent, has spent 17 years working on a range of projects in Africa and um, is originally a social anthropologist. And then our third speaker is going to be Dawn Haig Thomas from the GSM Association, who um, turned the concept of the development fund there into a reality and has overseen more than 30 projects in her work there and was previously a management consultant. So the way this is going to work is that um, I'll, I'll say a few things to start us off and then each of our speakers will take five to ten minutes to introduce their work. We might pick up some of the points and have a discussion here between the panellists, and then I'm going to hand over to the people in the audience to get uh, comments and reactions, and uh, then come back to our panellists to, to hear how they react to all of that. So we have an hour or so for this, and I think it's going to be a fantastic, fantastically interesting session. Um, I've been working in this area since around 2004, and um, mostly as a consultant for a number of mobile phone companies. In particular, I chair a, a Vodafone panel, the SIM panel, Socioeconomic Impact Mobile panel, which does uh, commissions research and peer reviews that research on a number of uh, projects over the years. We started out with a report on Africa in 2005, and that included um, a well-known paper by Len Waverman and some co-authors, which was the first estimate of the growth impact of mobiles. And his figures suggested that a 10% increase in mobile phone penetration led to a 0.6 percentage point increase in GDP growth, which might not sound much, but is actually a really big impact to find in this kind of regression. Ever since then, the estimates of the impact of these technologies, uh, mobiles and, and subsequently broadband, have only, only gone up over time. But Len himself, who's a terrific econometrician, was a little bit sceptical about the size of the impact that he found, and I think looking at um, the right degree of scepticism to bring to such estimates is one of the things we might pick up this evening. That particular panel, the SIM panel, has since published reports which are available on the company website on um, mobile transactions and on India, and we're midway through a project now on mobile broadband. But over that period, since 2005, the figures for mobile growth have been extraordinary, really. At the time, uh, there were six mobiles per every hundred people in in Africa, and that's gone up to 36 per 100 now. So it's not surprising that people have focused on this technology and its potential impacts. One of the things that interests me, obviously, is having done the work for a private sector company, Vodafone and others, including Nokia and MTN, is private sector engagement and the role played by the private sector, in particular the development role of private sector investment and how we should think about that. And another aspect which you come face to face with when you're working with the private sector is the impact of regulation and the right kinds of regulatory structures and, and tax structures, for that matter. But um, I think that's all I want to say for now. And I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Jenny, who will kick off and tell us about her work. Great. So thank you for letting me be here. I thought I'd start off with a little story, which was when, when I started working for a non-governmental organization in Ghana in 1997, uh, we didn't use mobile phones. We would dial into the server once a day to send and receive our emails. We would send faxes to our offices in Gambia, Liberia, where the printer would actually rub off off the paper. And then we would end up kind of using these car radios in order to communicate between rural villages and the capital cities where we worked. Now, when I was back in Ghana again this past August, um, things had changed pretty drastically. I was in a remote northern village near Tamale, and I was able to pick up my phone and call not only my mother, but also a colleague who was operating the capital city. At the same point in time, I was able to download messages on my Blackberry and figure out my location via GPS. So if you can imagine how useful mobile phones are for kind of field projects and field work, Think about what this means for populations who have traditionally had limited access to modern infrastructure. And as Diane mentioned, Sub-Saharan Africa has some of the lowest infrastructure investments in the world. Um, there's about five landlines available for every 1,000 people, about 29% of the roads are paved, and it has about 1% of the global electricity capacity. Now this is important because what this means is that traditional costs of communicating with members of your social and commercial network, of gaining access to information, 
via landlines, newspapers, radio, or personal travel have been traditionally very high. And while communication and information aren't everything, they're certainly extremely important for both economic and social development. So mobile phone communication, by contrast, has really reduced the cost of communicating over long distances. And what we've seen over the course of the past decade is a widespread in mobile phone coverage. About 60% of the um, sub-Saharan African population currently has access to mobile phone coverage. And it's estimated that mobile phone coverage will be in most villages by the time of the British Olympics. At the same time, despite the relatively high cost of these handsets and services, we've also seen an increase in adoption. It's estimated that about 376 million people are currently mobile phone subscribers, which represents about 30% of the population. And this widespread coverage and growth has prompted policymakers, journalists, presidents, and mobile phone companies to tout mobile phones as the next development miracle, um, especially for Africa. So the question is, is this the case or, or is it really hype? Um, and I think that what we've seen is that empirical research suggests that mobile phone coverage actually can be useful in making markets more efficient. When you look specifically at fish markets in India or millet markets in Niger, primarily by allowing producers, traders, and other entrepreneurs to get better access to information and make smarter choices about where to buy and sell. This seems to be kind of translating into net welfare gains by allowing traders to get higher prices, reducing waste. And it, but it isn't always clear kind of who's winning and who's losing. Nevertheless, it's evident that a lot of these benefits have been occurring without public sector investment, but just by private sector investment. Now, in response to this, what we've seen over the course of the past few years is a proliferation of mobile phone services, products, applications, some of which have a development focus. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are, you can now obtain price information, agricultural price information via SMS in India, Ghana, Senegal, and Niger. It's also a possibility to collect health data in Mozambique and in Congo. There are mobile phone literacy programs in Senegal, Niger, and in Pakistan, M banking, and it's being used as election monitoring in not only Kenya, but also more recently in Mozambique. And so far, the results of a lot of these projects have been, been quite promising. I'm working on a mobile phone literacy project in Niger that suggests that just knowing how to use a mobile phone is increasing literacy participants' math scores. And this is not only having an immediate impact, but also a long-term impact so that people can continue practicing their skills. So I think that we can and should be very excited about these innovations as they have the potential in order to kind of provide services that weren't available to poorer populations previously. At the same time, if we're thinking about this as a development tool, there are four lessons that I would really like to focus on or end with. First, I think it's pretty clear that mobile phone or mobile phone coverage has had an impact on market efficiency and welfare in certain contexts, but this is still for certain products in certain countries. We don't know if, know if this is going to be kind of a general trend, and it's not clear if these will gen tra generally translate into larger GDP gains. Second, while the kind of the excitement over mobile phones has spawned the growth of a lot of new applications, which is great, I don't think that we can always take for advantage um, the, the belief that using mobile phones is always going to be the better approach in terms of a more effective outcome or whether or not it's more cost effective. And I would really encourage us to look to pilot projects that would be comparing the traditional approach with a mobile phone based approach and comparing the costs and benefits of both of them to see whether, which one is going to be best. Third, I think that even if we find that mobile phones are better in providing certain services, whether it's banking, health information, or price information, or education, uh, we can't and we shouldn't be treating them as the silver bullet for development. Uh, you know, we can't be so overly excited to, to be negating or ignoring other investments that are going to be really necessary for development, like power, roads, and landlines. And finally, I think that if we, we do feel that mobile phones are a useful development tool, IT policy has to be something that we're discussing. I mean, despite the drastic reductions in costs of mobile phone handsets and services over the course of the past decade, uh, they're both relatively quite expensive, especially when you're looking at that in relationship to per capita income. And this is something that could be limiting, actually, the potential benefits of this technology. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Let's go straight on to Ken. Thanks, Jenny. Um, it's great to be here. I'm glad you've all managed to show up after a long day. Um, my career in mobile has been largely accidental. I never really thought that I'd be working in it after, after eight years, but, but when I actually stumbled into the discipline, uh, it was actually a very, very good time, because in, in 2003, when I did my first early 
mobile research in South Africa and Mozambique, things were beginning to happen. But it was still very, very early. And when I would speak to people and meet people, and they'd ask what I'm doing, and I would say, well, I'm trying to figure out how conservationists in the field can use mobile technology to help conservation work and help uh, in development and help rural communities to develop and communicate. So the first question was always, well, how can anybody out there afford a phone? And it was a pretty valid question because phones were still largely expensive. You needed contracts to buy them. There was little or no prepay. Uh, many people didn't have credit. And there was clearly potential, but there were lots and lots of barriers. And over the last eight years, uh, many of those barriers have, have come down. And one of the really big things to happen uh, over that time really has been the introduction of prepay, which has allowed people to get hold of SIM cards without needing credit histories and fixed addresses and all those types of things. And I think that uh, certainly for me, it's been very, very interesting to witness that growth. Um, my work really is, it's very practical. So for about 17 years now, I've been involved in many projects across Africa. I've lived and worked in about eight different African countries. My last really significant work was 2002. I lived in Nigeria for a year and, and ran a primate sanctuary. So you can probably tell from that that I'm not actually really um, necessarily qualified in IT to be doing mobile work. But it became very clear that mobile phones could become very, very useful. Uh, part of the challenge for me was, though, certainly in that very early work, that the potential was there, but there were many, many barriers. And we were sort of talking about digital divides in those days, and we still do talk of digital divides, and some people claim that, that the divide is now gone. Uh, I would argue that it's, uh, it's maybe smaller, but it's still there. But what we were doing was that, that people were building tools for non-profit organizations to use in the field to communicate en masse with communities, whether they're farmers, healthcare workers, human rights activists, or whatever it might be. They were building tools for these people to use, but the tools didn't actually work in many of the places where the problems were most severe. So many of the tools required the internet, they required high levels of, of technical expertise, they required maybe plenty of money, and they really weren't things that most people could use. And, and what I was witnessing uh, seven or so years ago was this tendency to build fairly technical, high-tech, quite sexy solutions to allow nonprofits to send large numbers of messages to people or to collect data uh, or to do whatever it was they were doing. And many smaller grassroots NGOs were completely left out because they couldn't access that technology. And I think a lot really hasn't changed when I look at what's happening even today in that area. People get very excited by iPads and Android phones and iPhones and cloud-based technologies. And in almost all the places where I've worked, uh, across Africa in particular, those technologies don't either exist or they don't work. And I think we need to sort of go back to basics to a large extent when we're looking to exploit the proliferation of mobile phones and make sure that we, if we're genuinely interested in helping nonprofits in turn help some disadvantaged communities in the areas they work, that we build tools that work in the places where the problems actually exist. Uh, so for the last seven or eight years, I've been really working on this problem. How do we lower the barriers to entry for these technologies? How do we build appropriate technologies for these organizations to use? How do we ensure that these tools genuinely empower the users who need to deploy them to solve their own problems? Many of the people that I meet who are building things to solve problems actually don't own the problem, and in many cases don't actually understand the problem. They're very, very far away from the malaria crisis or the human rights crisis or the HIV AIDS <laughs> epidemics. And they have a, a pretty rough idea of how a mobile technology might solve a problem. But for me, the best people to do that are the people actually on the ground in those countries who have a better understanding of the problem itself, a better understanding of the culture, a better understanding of the geography, gender issues that might exist in that area, uh, literacy, and all those other things. Uh, so. When it comes to sort of building these tools and developing solutions for mobiles and development, I think the way we need to be going is thinking about how we provide tools to people that allow them to take them themselves to deploy in their own areas without needing to fly dozens of potentially consultants out to those areas to train and deploy and make sure they work, to actually genuinely empower people so that these tools can be taken um, and really pulled by the owners of the problems rather than pushed out by us. 
Uh, the software I created in 2005 uh, called Frontline SMS, it's really a very, very simple text messaging hub, which it's really surprised me how it's taken off. And I, I think some of the keys to that have been that it allows people just to download a piece of software and just to run off and do what they want to do. There's no need to fly loads of people around and do all sorts of consultancy work. There's no need for high-end servers. There's no, e no need for the internet once it's downloaded. Uh, it's very, very simple to use. And for me, that's what empowerment looks like. Because if, if users can take a tool and deploy it themselves, there's an incredible sense of achievement among the users when they do that. One of the big criticisms I find in, in the work that I see and in, in some of the work that I'm involved in some of the time is that projects go out and they deploy technologies and then when they leave, everything collapses and the users are blamed for not taking interest, for not being bothered, for being lazy and all those things. And the fact of the matter is that quite often the solution either didn't work or nobody wanted it. And I think we need to sort of get around that mindset and figure out different ways of, of delivering these tools. Some of the really interesting things happening right now, uh, particularly in Africa, is this sort of rise of the innovation hub. In the last year or two, we're seeing incredible movement on the development and creation of business and innovation hubs. Uh, East Africa's uh, in Nairobi recently one called iHub, which has just opened up are really trying to foster local talent, uh, local IT expertise, local knowledge of the problems that exist in those countries, and to create an environment where people can build solutions to their own problems and access local talent to do that. And that's a big shift for me. Uh, if we look at development traditionally, if you wanted to do development in the 1970s, you'd have to fly out with a bunch of concrete and build a dam, because that was pretty much what development was. But with mobile development kits and with the internet now, and just the reach of mobile technology, anybody in their bedroom can build a tool that could potentially help millions of people with very little money, very little infrastructure, and just a lot of determination and a knowledge and understanding of a problem. And for me, that's really the most interesting thing. I think we're going to find, as we're beginning to see now, more and more innovation happening in developing countries, things like M-Banking, where many African countries are streets ahead of us. I, I can't get up, go outside this building now and pay for a cab with my mobile phone, but if I was in Nairobi, I could. I think we're going to see more and more of these innovations and more and more of this technology working its way back to us. And I think our role as a final point should be to ensure that we encourage that type of environment and don't try to be too controlling over what looks to be a fantastic opportunity for us. Thank you very much, Ken. And straight on still, thank you. Hi, <coughs> pleasure to be here tonight as well. Um, if I just start off by introducing the GSMA who I work for, it's uh, to, to set the scene. Um, so I guess I'm here representing the industry, the telecoms industry. Um, the GSM Association was started 21 years ago and it is the global trade association for mobile phone operators. When it started it was very much about the European operators only and it was about ensuring interoperability between mobile phones so that when people travelled they would be able to use their phone wherever they went to. The association has changed enormously in the last 21 years. Um, really in line with the technology and in line with the demands of the marketplace. We now have over 800 uh, members, so anybody with a GSM, a mobile phone license, globally is a member of ours, and we have a presence in 219 countries. There's also a second tier of membership, which is the vendor organisation, those people that support the mobile network operators, such as handset providers and base station <coughs> providers. So, so that's, that's who I work for. I moved um, from being a, a management consultant, as Diane mentioned, in 2006, when I was offered this great opportunity to really react and make real um, a new department for the GSMA that would um, reflect and respond to a lot of the academic research that was coming through. And Diane mentioned one particular study that was put out by LBS Len Waverman on how increase, increasing mobile penetration rates leads to an increase in, in GDP. Um, at the same time, we were also seeing a lot of um, microeconomic studies coming through around farmers, around fishermen who own mobile phones and the impact that only a mobile phone was, was really having on, on their life. Um, I should also set the scene, back in 2006, there were 2 billion mobile users 
and as we've mentioned, uh, now, five, now uh, five billion anticipated by the end of the year. That's an ITU as well as a, a GSMA um, statistic. So as you can imagine, the whole mobile landscape has changed enormously in these last four years. It's the fastest growing technology in history, and uh, it's a really exciting place to be. Um, just by the nature of what we do as an industry, um, we are helping with social and economic development. You know, I've, you know, I very much uh, firmly believe that, and our, our mantra is um, is well used. You know, doing good is good business. Um, I should also say, back in 2006, there was a lot of talk about the village phone model, and this was a model that had come was very popular in Bangladesh first and foremost, and not seen anywhere else. And it was where women were owning a mobile phone, were becoming owners of mobile phones, and then letting out their mobile phone to friends and family for a fee, and in this way earning an income for themselves for the first time. And at peak, 230,000 women were uh, making a living in this way. So one of our first challenges as the development fund was really to have a look at that model and understand how we could replicate this, how we could take it elsewhere. And um, we, we did just that. We, we took the model on to Uganda and Nigeria, in all instances working with our mobile operator partners. That's very much how the development fund works. What we like to do is work with the strategy and the marketing teams of mobile phone operators, as opposed to the CSR departments and opposed, as opposed to the foundations. We very much believe that serving the base of the pyramid should be core business. And mobile operators for the past 10, 15 years have been very, very focused on simply rolling out networks, getting coverage out there. And the urban areas generally in the developing world are now starting to become saturated and increasingly they're looking to, to the rural areas. Um, but there's been a real land grab going on in the operator space just simply to get coverage out there. And therefore, what we did was provide project managers, business analysts, um, uh, typically with an MBA or a consulting background, who would go and do the figures and say, this is the value of your base of the pyramid marketplace. Um, please, can we work with you to move into it, to help you move into it? Um, we also you know, drew a lot of inspiration from the original village phone concept and asked the question, well, what next? So we've had the shared mobile phone model. What can mobile technology um, do next in terms of local employment creation and bringing connectivity? And the answer was, of course, 3G, or uh, edge-enabled um, internet connectivity. So using the new data networks, um, which is, of course, how the majority of the world will become connected to the internet for the first time, not through fixed line infrastructure, but through mobile infrastructure. And uh, we worked together with Grameen Phone on rolling out what we called community information centres. And we piloted 15 pretty rapidly. We took about two months to get 15 community information centres up and running. Again, like with the village phone lady model, we created, we, we hired an entrepreneur. I think we had three applications for every entrepreneur that we hired. And they made the shop their business and the village and the community would come in and would use the services and connect to the internet for the first time. And we rapidly saw um, exam results, e-government services being taken up very, very quickly as, of course, um, you know, entertainment as well, checking football scores and, and favourite bands. And I think one of my favourite um, the things that I witnessed in, in the community centre in, in Bangladesh was actually a marriage happening between someone in Bangladesh and somebody in Dubai. Um, the husband was, or the husband B, was over in Dubai and was waiting for the wife to join, um, but couldn't until they, they were married. So, you know, we saw some really interesting social, social change happening as well in those early days. The 15 community information centres uh, were a success in terms of they were profitable for Grameen Phone, first and foremost, which we were pleased about. The um, reason we were pleased is because then they would scale up. Um, they were creating an income for the local entrepreneurs and they were creating connectivity for a village for the first time. And there are now 550, uh, so every upazilla, every sub-district in Bangladesh 
now has a community information centre. So we very much focused on access in 2006, 2007. Um, interestingly, we started to move into some specialist communities, uh, for want of a better word, and I, I can see our project manager here actually today from Uganda. Um, we took the refugee situation. We visited some refugee camps, and of course these house much bigger numbers than a lot of people anticipate. Um, in northern Uganda, we visited one camp with 25,000 people living there on average for 20 years. And they had no connectivity. And we spoke to people who spent $10 taking a bus into Kampala to then spend $5 on an internet connection <coughs> to send emails and $10 on the bus back. Uh, this is you know, a classic example of seeing the poverty penalty, as it's known, um, in play, people who are disenfranchised and disconnected actually having to pay a price on top of the cost of the normal products and services just simply to access them. So again in this situation um, we worked with the operator, mobile operator MTN to build the business case and say look it makes good business sense to connect these camps up. Um, there is huge latent demand for both voice and internet and in that situation, um, Ericsson donated two base stations too, and now that is um, up and running and, and a profitable area for, for MTN. So that's an, another sort of example from the early days. We then stood back and we said, okay, what are the other barriers to uptake, a bit like Ken was talking about? And one of the big ones is energy. Um, you don't need a lot of energy to run a, a cell tower, a base station. Uh, the masts that you, that you see out there providing connectivity. Uh, I think you need as the same amount as to, to boil a kettle, but you need some electricity. So without it, you're not going to be able to move into the rural areas very easily. You also need power to charge your phone. And um, a colleague just returned from Uganda last week and uh, reported talking to villagers in the rural areas who spent $5 a month on their mobile phone bills, uh, their prepay, and $3 a month on charging their phone. So that might be a bus ride somewhere to then access electricity, or that might be using a car battery, paying the guy that owns the car battery. So again, you see the poverty penalty in play, and what can the mobile industry do about trying to solve some of these issues? Um, back in 2007, I went to visit Motorola down in Swindon, and they proudly showed me their base station that had been running on wind and solar, um, and it had run for a year and had been down for one day when it was very foggy over Christmas. So I said, well, this is great. We've got to take this, um, we've got to export this to Africa and Asia. And we did that. We then ran a project in Namibia with the mobile operator MTC down there, quickly proved the concept. And we now have a whole green power for mobile program that um, is global and is supporting eight different operators at the moment, including a PAM Latin American rollout of wind and solar powered base stations with Telefonica. Um, more recently, I should say, so we've started a drawback again and have a look at, okay, the access problem is starting to be solved itself. You know, we're at five billion users by the end of this year. So now let's look at what mobile phones, what else they can do. And we're looking at products and we're looking at services. And we have a large program called Mobile Money for the Unbanked. It's a Bill and Melinda Gates funded, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded program. And we're supporting 20 mobile operators globally on rolling out their mobile money services, um, which is basically enabling people to, to send um, money from one person to the other. It's still happening domestically, mainly at the moment. Uh, within markets, but we're also looking to now start piloting internationally so that we can see some of those big remittance corridors between countries being serviced by the mobile industry. Um, more recently, in a project that's quite uh, close to my heart, on our travels over the last few years, we observed that many fewer women than men had mobile phones, and we decided we needed some anecdotal evidence um, some solid, sorry, rather some solid uh, data to, um, to to back up what we believed was happening out there. We ran a piece of research last year. We launched the report in February this year, and we found that 300 million fewer women than men owned mobile phones. Um, this represents a gender gap of globally 21% fewer women than men owning a phone, 
and in some areas such as southern Asia the gap is as great as 37 um, 37% so this is an area that we're now starting to move into and announcing a program next month to work to close the gender gap um, why is this interesting um, it's interesting I think because women are very significant agents of development change um, there will be there's potential for huge social and economic um, impact if we connect these women and on the commercial side which is obviously what my operator community are more interested in or no I shouldn't say more interested in, but um, you know the primary drivers as business people um, it's a 13 billion dollar missed revenue opportunity so gender gaps a big area that I'm um, very interested in as well as now looking at the challenge of connecting the, the rural populations um, the, the, the urban populations are generally becoming saturated and rural is the next big challenge so hopefully we'll move on to that and some of the questions. I'll wrap up there, thanks. Thank you. It's uh, actually very nice to see a reverse gender gap on the panel this evening. It makes a change <laughs> in either a mobile or an economics audience. Um, before we turn to the audience for some reactions to that, I want to pick up one issue with um, the panel members, which you've all touched on in different ways, and that's how to evaluate properly the impact of mobile. Taryn Dickerman has sent in a comment specifically about this and says, um, if we want to learn about the impact that mobile phones have on prices, on savings or on health behaviours, we need to be able to say that the changes in these outcomes would not have happened in the absence of mobile phones. This is a very difficult question to substantiate. There are just too many other parts, moving parts of an economy that contribute to GDP growth to know how much mobile phones increase GDP. Too many factors could, could interfere. And um, there's an example here of their work in Malawi where they wanted to look at whether mobile phones have been important for people working in the market. But they realised that the um, Phone operators were not randomly building cell towers, they were building them along main roads or in urban areas and tourist areas before expanding into the rural areas. So that meant that to make the comparison you had to match the areas much more carefully than they had first, they had first realised. So on, on this evaluation question, um, Jenny, you mentioned this first in, in your remarks. Do you think we actually have a handle on how to make these evaluations properly? I mean, I think there's two aspects. One is the, the aspect of mobile phone coverage. How is that private sector investment having an impact on markets and the way they work and function? The second aspect is if you're using mobile phone project for development, how do you compare that with some of these more traditional programs? And I would say the latter, while not easier, is a little bit easier if you're working with a non-government to say, for example, a program in Niger, the NGO wanted to do a literacy program, so some of the villages got regular literacy. Regular literacy for development is actually quite a new discipline. You could argue it's only maybe five, six, seven years old, and we're still very much learning on our feet in most cases. The, the, the challenge in, in measuring impact, well, there's, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence. When you go out and speak to people, when you go into, into markets in, in Lagos or in Calabar or in Nairobi and you speak to business people, they will be very, very clear the value that mobile phones have brought them and the business opportunities and the increase in income by, able, by being able to be out in one place doing one job and then having a little poster somewhere with a mobile phone number on which allows them to get business when they finish that particular piece of work. But how you actually measure that and put numbers on, it's, it's hugely difficult. We're actually going through this process right now ourselves with Frontline SMS, a piece of software that's being used in over 50 countries. And we don't really know, in number terms, what that actually means. It, it might sound quite impressive, but what's the real impact been? I'll just finish with a, you know, a quick example on that. In, in 2007, our software was used to help monitor the Nigerian elections. And it was the first time it's believed that Nigerian civil society NGOs used mobile technologies to allow Africans to help monitor their own election. Now, next year, there, there should be another election in Nigeria. It's looking a bit dubious right now, but there should be another election in Nigeria. Now, how we can prove that things are going to be better this time round because our software was used in 2007, I absolutely have no idea how you do that. And maybe this is where the academia can come in and try to figure out what we should be measuring and what you need to look for. But there are many, many really quite groundbreaking projects, projects like Ushahidi, a crowdsourcing service that's been used in Haiti and during the Kenyan election violence and, and used globally. Even they don't really know what the end result of their tool is and what that impact is and what you even look for. And there are donors out there now who are starting to take a, a very strong interest. One in particular is the Amidyar Network, which is funded by Pierre Amidyar, who founded eBay. 
and they're very interested in helping people start to come to terms with how you measure these things. But right now, I don't think we really have many answers. Don, let me put the question to you another way and ask if people are willing to spend their money on mobiles and companies are making a profit out of it, do we need to worry all that much about understanding impacts in other ways? A good, good question. I was going to say that yeah, my perspective on this is somewhat different and probably sounds somewhat crude. I, I guess uh, as the development fund, we, we read the academic evidence that is coming through on, on how mobile phones are changing people's lives and we leave that really to, to the experts. And what we care about most as the development fund is really, are we increasing number of subscribers in a particular community um, where there is a particular gap that we've identified and um, well, you know, what are the, the ARPUs, the average revenue per user coming through on, on those areas? And if we see that, you know, we've, we've done our research early on in terms of who we want to target, if then we're seeing uptake, we generally are happy because we see that then the mobile operators will continue to support that particular area um, and grow the business. So, yes, I mean, it is eating into other, uh, other business um, areas. So, you know, we get lots of grumbles in, in East Africa from the beer companies and the Coca-Cola companies that um, mobile phones have eaten into their profits. Whether that's a good thing or not is another question. <laughs> uh, let me turn now to members of the audience for your questions, comments, reactions. We'll gather a few together and then we'll come back to the panel. So, there's some hands in the middle. The gentleman there in the blue shirt first. And who wants to go next? One over there, the second question. Yeah, go ahead. Can right. you tell us who you are as well? Yeah, my name is uh, Anand Nortyal, and I'm from a consulting firm called Coffee International, and we actually work quite closely with the GSM Association on the mobile money for the unbanked fund. And um, Don, it's great to see you today and the panel. But actually, this question's uh, um, particularly directed at Ken, uh, but everybody else, you know, if you want to add to that, that's fantastic. Uh, as I said, I work on this project that is all about uh, using mobile phones as a platform to provide financial services to people living on less than $2 a day. Uh, and what we found is that while there's a great precedent for the service in Safaricom in Kenya, where the service has basically taken off the shelves and just, you know, flown off, and beaten every possible expectation that might have been had from it, uh, there's a large number of other applications around the markets, around the world, which are sort of lagging behind in terms of activity rates. So in a, lo in a lot of other deployments, you find that customers are introduced to the idea, and they register for the service, and they make that critical first transaction, and then they just don't make any other transactions you know, for a very long time. And so as somebody who's introduced a service that has similarly taken off the shelves uh, and really found a key in the uh, a sort of spot in the market where customers are willing to use it again and again, what is your perspective on why activity rates are low on, on pretty much the same service that you know, flew off the shelves in Kenya, but in other markets is finding it difficult to find that kind of acceptance amongst the population? Is it that we are perhaps trying to push a product uh, that doesn't quite have that kind of um, you know, market need in other contexts, or, or is it something else? What is your perspective on that as an entrepreneur? We'll, we'll give Ken some time to reflect on that, and, and, but not let him off the hook. <laughs> Second question was um, over there at the side. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Um, my name is Rohit Singh. I'm from the Overseas Development Institute in London. Um, I thought my question is basically around the issue of access and widening access. I think Dawn, you, you touched upon that being um, a real major issue, and um, I just wondered <coughs> whether things like universal access funds, where um, you know mobile operators contribute a certain proportion of their revenues towards a centralised fund, which is then used to to subsidise rollout of infrastructure. Um, has been something that you think has worked particularly well or has mobile competition amongst the operators themselves and government getting out of the way and allowing you know, um, a number of operators to compete, has that been sufficient in driving you know, sufficient competition to drive the prices down and increase penetration and so on? Um, so, and the other, the other point I just wanted to make was about the importance of regulation um, because in a technology like this where um, you know there are issues around frequency and allocation and around um, you know interconnection tariffs and so on 
um, how important is it for governments to be ahead of the game there and, and have decent regulatory structures in, in order to have the, the development benefits seen at the end? Thank you very much. Let's take a third one. There's a lady here next. Hi, uh, Claire Malamed, also from the uh, Overseas Development Institute. Um, I was very struck um, by, by the presentations and also just in terms of sort of watching the phenomenon of mobile phones over in Africa, particularly over the, the last several years, that it's something which has happened, which has been driven really entirely by the private sector and by the kinds of funds and foundations that have been established through the private sector. Um, and the traditional donors um, have been almost entirely absent from this phenomenon. <laughs> so I just wondered whether, um, you know, you think on the panel from your various experience, you think there are gaps which traditional donors could usefully fill in terms of overcoming, for example, some of the inequalities in access that have been talked about, or whether really it's far better that they should just stay out of the way because, you know, wh whether the whether the success of mobile phones, I suppose the question is whether the success of mobile phones has been despite or because of the absence of donors. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more and then come back to the panel for some reactions. Gentlemen, one of these, one of these two gentlemen, and then we'll come back to you later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, from the Central Bank in Rwanda. Um, from your discussions, really, I, I've seen that you've concentrated on the contribution of the phone, actually, in terms of benefiting uh, the ordinary people. There is one area that you haven't touched on. Uh, in the case of Rwanda, this is just normal business, uh, whereby everybody now, they all see the use of, uh, of the mobile phones for everything, really, for prices, for banking, for almost everything. But there is one area that we initially were excited, and is working very well, uh, which is now we are starting to worry as regulators. Uh, of how to do it, and that's where I wanted just to uh, tap into your experience. Initially, when, this, when we started using it for payment, especially for the rural and banked, it was very exciting. I, I myself have one. I used to pay my, I pay my bills, electricity, water, you know, everything, transfer the money. Uh, that's ex exciting, and you could see the students and others in the rural areas, of course, excited about it because now it's working in Rwanda. But now we are getting worried because the uh, telecommunication companies and the banks working together, they are now thinking in terms of cross-border uh, payment system. Uh, in the case uh, of Rwanda, they are thinking in terms of Uganda, Eastern Congo, and Burundi. And now, this has implications for the regulation of that industry. Uh, globally, usually in the East African community, we're working on, on how to make sure that we almost interlink our payment system the, uh, using the real-time gross settlements uh, system uh, I've seen uh, the deputy governor of Uganda here. He knows the advance in Uganda, in Kenya, and others. And we are also working very hard to see how we can integrate within the East African community. Uh, we are also uh, integrating in so many other ways. But this industry, we don't have an experience in terms of regulation, especially when it comes to cross-border. Uh, we wanted to see if you have any experience uh, from the uh, different countries you're working in. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's uh, already quite a, a rich array of questions. We'll come back for another round of questions from the audience afterwards, but uh, let's pick up on, on these first. Ken, you've had time to think about hmm. why, why things work in some places and not others. Yeah, I think the, with, with mobile payments and M-Pesa and, and, and these types of services, probably a few things that, that are probably worth considering. It's a good, good question. I think the general belief that, that because one thing works somewhere, it'll work everywhere, is generally assumed, but it's usually wrong um, and we need to be aware of that so just because MPS took off in Kenya so well uh, it doesn't mean it's going to take off everywhere else uh, I think there's also um, the work that we do we, we work through local NGOs we my, me myself I've never gone out and installed our software on any computer anywhere because that's not our model so the difference between that and selling a consumer product or a consumer service such as mobile payments is they're completely different in, in how you approach them. So consumers need to be educated. There needs to be, needs to be trust. Uh, people traditionally do things in their own way. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to encourage people to change behavior. Uh, people have transferred money around for a long time through indigenous payment systems and middlemen and various other systems. Maybe they were very inefficient and cost money but they worked and there was trust networks built up around those. And when you bring a technology in, you're kind of trying to push that to one side and replace it with something which is foreign, which is unknown. There's also a tipping point. Uh, 
there comes a point where you know if you're not on something, if you're not Safaricom customer and you can't receive money, it's to your disadvantage and therefore you're kind of pushed onto Safaricom because of that. Uh, so there's always that early early kind of stage where you need to get that critical mass to actually make it make it worthwhile. Um, and the final thing I think as well is that it is certainly worth bearing in mind that, that mobile payments was not uh, the idea of Vodafone or Diffid or any of these, these Western donors. In Uganda, Jan Chipchase, who's an anthropologist who used to work for Nokia, did some very early work, and somebody called Jonathan Donner, who works at Microsoft Research, did some very early work on how people were actually transferring money around the networks just by texting the scratch card numbers, they'd buy a five, a 50, sh 50 shilling credit, and they'd scratch the number off and they'd text that to somebody that they owed 50 shillings to, and they would then put that number into their phone and it would increase their credit by 50 shillings, and that was a mobile payment. And that's really where the, the idea for mobile payments came from. It was actually an indigenous response to solving the problem of transferring money, and it's just been formalized by, by M-Pesa. I think a final thing as well to, to bear in mind is not all governments are conducive so this kind of thing, there's huge monopoly issues in Kenya. People are very worried and there's been, been talk of licenses being revoked and that Safaricom aren't a bank and all this type of thing. And when M-Pesa was recently launched in Afghanistan, I think it's called M-Pesa or M-Pisa, very, very similar word, but slightly different. When they started using that, there was a lot of government resistance. And I remember reading that the first, one of the first things that happened was that the, the police actually responded when they started getting their salaries through their phones and they all said, oh, thanks for the pay rise. And what was happening was that, that officials were creaming off money from salaries before they were going to the police. And once the mobile payment system was in place, they were actually getting their full salary and they thought they were getting a pay rise. So there's lots of, lots of behavioural things that we need to think about. The technology is actually very, very easy, but it's all the sort of behavioural, cultural, long-standing, traditional things that we need to consider to, to determine whether or not these things will replicate and will work in other places. I might um, follow up on that and, and pick up on this last question too. Um, as Ken says, countries are different, and um, when you're thinking about mobile payments, you need to think about, about the retail outlets, and that's very different in Kenya than it is in India, where mobile payments are following a different model. You need to think about the regulatory environment and the competition policy, and all of those will have different impacts on, on the success in different countries. And I think just to follow up on that, the regulatory issues around mobile money are a particularly difficult case. and. Um, very different which, as between remittances and the sort of, the sort of um, uh, cross-border normal transactions that, that you're talking about. And I think there is no easy answer to it. It's just extremely complicated, actually, because there's the settlement system to consider, there's the access to the uh, clearing system and the interbank system to consider. And um, the model that we have for that is how does that work in, in the Western banking system? And it's not obvious that that transfers directly into a group of East African countries where there's a different competitive framework and a different set of experiences to bring to it. Um, so I think actually um, from the government perspective it's right to be somewhat cautious about what the private sector is considering in, in, in that area and just try and work it through extremely carefully. And um, we did do a paper about these regulatory issues in our mobile money report which, which touched on some of them and, but only enough to sort of lift the veil on the complexity of what needs to be done. Dawn, do you want to respond on access? Sure. <clears throat> um, so the question was around the, the Universal Service Funds. That's where the, the question started off. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Universal Service Funds, this has been a tax on mobile operators that has been put in place in uh, various developing world countries. And the idea is that the money would be collected by the government and then spent on connecting the remotest and the most rural communities. Um, great idea. I think in reality we've been very disappointed in actually seeing the money spent. Um, I think it was back in 2007 the figure was um, put on it of six billion dollars had been collected for universal service funds um, and virtually none of this had actually ever been spent. So. We, we've looked at the development fund if we could actually help in any way in, in, in trying to spend some of that money. Um, I think there's been a bit of a freeze. I think I think governments have been considering a lot of different options um, as to how they can best do this. And that's why the money hasn't been spent to date, but it's something that we would definitely like to see moved on. So your question then led on to or does competition really do the job? And I think I would say yes. What we're seeing is... Um, it is such a fiercely competitive marketplace 
out there and technologies are getting better and cheaper every day and we're now seeing real micro solutions for, for mobile networks coming through in the marketplace. Companies like Alto Bridge and VNL um, who are specifically targeting villages of just one, two hundred people and they are you know, very low cost solutions um, that can bolt on to the likes of the big Ericsson, Nokia, Siemens, Motorola networks, etc. Um, there is continued consolidation um, and buyouts happening in the industry as well. I'm personally very excited about the recent Bharti Airtel acquisition of Zane, Bharti being India's largest mobile operator, buying out Zane, um, Pan, African mobile operator. Uh, I think that's a real watch this space how you bill uh, or how they measure success uh, as Bharti in India is very much on how many minutes people use um, as opposed to the average revenue per user which is the traditional um, measurement of success for a mobile operator. Um, so yeah I, I would say I think we're going to see some big change with, with Bharti moving into Africa and uh, I think competition is going to do the job of connecting those rural areas. Thank you Dylan. Jenny I say for you a question about has this worked? because of the absence of traditional donors or not. And I wonder if I can link it to a point you made in your opening remarks about um, other infrastructure too and whether the interplay of other infrastructure is relevant here. I mean, I think it's relevant in both cases. I mean, number one, in many cases, these applications and these services probably wouldn't have been developed without the private sector, right? There's a lot of innovation going on. This is their traditional strength. But the question is, number one, uh, would some of these applications actually have been developed if the public sector hadn't de demanded them, or in many cases, the NGOs or governments hadn't demanded them? And number two, even if these hardware is developed, you know, the mobile phone technology, we can build it, but will you come? Um, doesn't necessarily mean that people will use it without the corresponding software. So I'm going to use the example of, we use um, Frontline SMS in Niger in particular, where we'd observed that traders were calling around to get price information, but because SMS is so much cheaper than calling, they preferred to, to send text messages. However, the liter illiteracy rates in Niger are quite high. So we set up with this NGO using Frontline SMS a system whereby producers and different farmers could send in a code and get access to market price information. Now, if we had just had the hardware, it wouldn't have gone very far. There need to be some corresponding software in terms of sensitization, how to type in the codes, how to set up the system. And this really required public sector investment, the investment of certain types of donors and also certain types of NGOs to bring the two of them together in order to determine whether or not this is something that could actually be adopted. It seems like this is something that is being used, but I think the conjunction of both of those things together is really important. Secondly, you know, even going beyond the hardware software link, as we mentioned previously, if you can call around and find prices for your grain in Niger, and you find out that the best price for your cowpea is about 100 kilometers away, but the road that links you and that market is completely cut off in the rainy season, there's not very much you can do about it. Or you could do something about it, but it might end up taking you five or six or seven hours to get there, and by the time that you get there, maybe there isn't any more demand for your cowpea. So you, know, you can have access to that information and that communication, but if you don't have these corresponding infrastructure, you might not necessarily be able to take advantage of it. Thank you. Now we've got time for another round of questions and comments. The gentleman at the front here was first in line. Who wants to go next? In, in the middle there. So we'll take those two first. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. The name is Lansana Nyali from Sierra Leone. Question one. Is this the end of land phone technology? Second, besides the costs on the poor people of keeping cell phones, in my country, cell phones are very easy to steal, and they get missing very frequently. I'm sure the mobile companies have the technology to stop that, but they don't because it's spread the number of phones that's available. What's been done about that? Third, many of this energy power that supplies the line are located in community areas where they are crowded. The energy is being transmitted. What's been done about the people within the surrounding area and their health? Final question. My uncle used to tell me 
but a mobile phone is harder to feel than a child. Because you can eat cassava with your child, but you can eat uh, cassava with your telephone. Telephone always eat money. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You might not get answers to all four, but we'll see. <laughs> There's, uh, in the middle of there. Um, Amita Benaisa from Uganda. Question to Dawn Haig Thomas. You talked about um, energy and solar um, servers. Where were you to date with in terms of solar mobile phones? I know there was a discussion saying that there is not enough um, manufacturers of solar panels in order to make um, solar mobiles or make it viable for, for um, operators or uh, mobile production, but I'd like to know um, where you are with that. And the second question is also, is there a strategy um, to engage? Because um, from different parts of the panel, there was talk about, you know, the cost, for example, the literacy program in Niger, and, but is there a strategy to engage entrepreneurs on the ground? Um, I spent uh, six months working in Nigeria, and there's a lot of wealthy people, and I'm sure if they were aware of these opportunities to expand networks or whatever, or working in partnership with the operators, perhaps they'd get involved because they're millionaires with not very much to do with their money. Um, so I'm just wondering if there is a strategy to engage such entrepreneurs that are already on the ground. That's my question. Thank you. One of his. Hi, it's working. Hi, my name is Nicola Amostovaco from the International Growth Center. Um, well, my question is, I, I would like, if it's possible, to shift a little bit from the uh, technological point of view and asking uh, from a more sociological perspective. Um, uh, studying development, I found that um, one of the biggest problems is social cohesion, so the lack of social cohesion, the lack of communication between different groups in, in the same nation. And I'm wondering, do you think that um, this new era of mobile phone in the new country could help in fostering communication and transparency in uh, between different groups in the same nation. And I'm, you know, I was very, very impressed by the, the, the example that Mr. Banks gave before about the Nigerian election. And if it, this is the case, I'm wondering if uh, there's the possibility, the space for collaboration from the pri between the private company and the government in order to provide, uh, I can say, uh, a more uh, um, solid consensus and stability for uh, for for the government election and then for you know solving the time time consistency problem. So the mobile phone, the technology is uh, available and is willing to uh, how can I say solve the communication problem or there is a lack of of consumption in uh, in uh, in this country that. Uh, um, that is still stronger the 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 the, the, the new the, the newer technology era. Yeah. Thank you. And um, somebody in the middle had their hand up. Oh yes, gentleman in the blue t-shirt in the middle there. Yep. Ian Mansfield from Saturday News website. Uh, a query about a trend that started probably about two years ago with mainly developing countries starting to demand ID from people before they can take out a prepay SIM card. Whenever it's been deployed, you've typically seen something like about a 10% slump in the subscriber base that I've seen on reports, which can be put down to people not registering dual SIM cards, etc. But how significant do you think this is going to be on subscriber growth, particularly as the network's push out into the rural areas where availability of government ID documentation may not be quite so extensive as it is in the um, urban areas. Thank you. Well, we've got um, quite a lot of topics to pick up here, and I'm going to let you take your pick. So let's start with Jenny this time. Where do you like to go? Oh, great. Um, so maybe I would just talk a little bit about the sociological perspective, even though I'm not a sociologist, but having kind of observed this impact. And I think that mobile phone technology can go both ways. I mean, on, on one hand, because it reduces these communication costs, 
You could talk with people more frequently. People that we talk, speak with in need there primarily have said that they've used it to communicate with family members in the capital city, if they're in northern Nigeria, if they've migrated somewhere. So it makes these communications more frequent, not only if there's a shock. At the same point in time, it could, it could in theory, perhaps lessen the strength of those certain social networks because it might broaden your social network and allow you to have kind of a broader circle social and commercial network. And so that's one thing that we've seen with traditional grain traders where they would call back and forth. They would have a, a very specific social network. Once cell phones arrived, they could call around to other markets, which broadened their social network. And what we didn't look at was, well, how did that affect your existing social network? In, in terms of, though, kind of providing access to greater transparency, I think Ken had mentioned this is really the, the power of frontline SMS and Ushahidi with these elections. So, so last year I worked with Pedro Vicente on this program in Mozambique. It's also been used in you know Ghana and Sierra Leone, in India and Mexico, uh, whereby you know people could either call in, go on the web to report potential electoral violations. We also received SMS messages which provided information on civic education, and this has been not necessarily credited for making the elections more free and transparent, but it allowed people to kind of voice their concerns if they viewed a violation of the electoral process happening. More recently in the election, or the, the, the election violence or the riots about two weeks ago in Mozambique, what you saw again is that people were calling in using SMS, using Oshahidi to report the advent of these riots or whether or not kind of police officers were being violent with certain populations. And so I think that there is a potential for this to be more transparent. At the same point in time, it's a double-edged sword in the sense that um, if that information isn't monitored, if it's not verified, or you say, well, I've received this report, is someone on the ground actually there to say, well, yes, this actually happened or not, then there's always the possibility that this could spread misinformation. So you know, information is good, but it has to be the correct information, and there has to be a system for verification. Thank you. Ken, what would you like to pick up? I can do two sentences on, on four, if you like, and do it quickly. Um, Remind did, us which one four was. Um, well, like, on, on four of them. Oh. <laughs> the, the theft one is, um, is a, I have no answer to that, but I do know that a study in, in Nigeria that uh, market traders cited theft as being the biggest barrier for them to own a phone. And they were very, very concerned about the theft of particularly higher end phones, so people weren't very, um, certainly didn't flash their phones around particularly. Um, how you get around that is another question, but it's, it was certainly a big concern in, in that survey. I think the, um, the transparency thing that um, Jenny just touched on as well, I think the, the important thing to remember about these systems that allow people to, to communicate and to communicate across cultures and to report things to more generally, there has to be a will on the ground for those organizations or those people to do it. The technology's there now. So one of the things that Ushahidi struggle with to a degree is that when, when something happens somewhere, there's an earthquake, there's violence, election, somebody will email them and say, are you going to do something around this event? And they will know, you know, we need somebody in that country who's actually concerned about fixing the problem to actually do it. So there has to be a will. The technology's there. There has to be a will to actually make it work. And there is a lot of issues around misinformation. The Mozambique riots recently, SMS was actually blamed for causing a lot of the riots and misinformation spreading of malicious gossip and, and, and innuendos and all sorts of things around, around that. And then finally, the, um, the SIM registration one. I do know, certainly through our work, and certainly with Frontline SMS, which initially, for the first two and a half years, was really seen as an activist tool. The first users were in countries where the regimes were, were particularly unfriendly to free speech. And they found it very, very useful uh, as a way of spreading information and messages uh, in those places. Since the registrations have come in, though, it's become increasingly difficult for free speech in countries where governments don't necessarily want it. Whether or not sales go up and down, I'm not particularly bothered. Maybe Dawn is maybe slightly more concerned about, about that, but certainly for the spread of democracy, transparency, rule of law, and those kinds of challenges where you have NGOs on the ground who are working very hard to foster those kinds of environments, the registration of SIM cards has become a really big issue. And if they're lucky, they get two days of use before they have to register it. Some countries have that. So you can buy it, use it for two days anonymously, bin it, buy another one. But the phone also has to be thrown away because the phone is also recorded and registered in the transactions. And if you don't, don't get rid of the phone, then you can still be picked up as the person uh, sending those messages. I'd like to add a word on theft, actually, and feed in something that uh, Tabneet Suri emailed, um, saying that one of the important impacts of mobiles is improved risk sharing, that people who um, run out of money can contact a relative to get them to send some money and um, so I think there are, 
obviously increased risks in some ways and reduced risks in other ways. There's a lot of evidence in the mobile transaction schemes that people will put money in at the beginning of their journey and take it out again at the end of their journey because um, they reduce the risk of the theft of the money. So on the one hand, you have the increased risk of the theft of the phone, and on the other hand, you have reduced risks in some other ways. Mm. Don? There are quite a few issues here that you might... Yes, I might actually just quickly continue on from that because one interesting piece of um, information that came through from our gender gap research on security was that 9 out of 10 women who owned a mobile phone reported feeling safer owning a mobile phone. Um, so yes, there are pros and cons, there's a theft risk, but there's also a, I'm walking home from work late at night, this is now making me feel safer. So, um, slight swings and roundabouts there. I think um, to pick up on the solar mobile handsets, um, good question. They are coming to market now. We are seeing handsets that on the back there is a solar panel that will charge the handset as quick as if you had it plugged into an electricity point. Um, that's been a change. I would say just even four years ago, the smallest solar panel was probably that size and you had to plug it into your phone to charge it. But as solar technology has got better and better, uh, we now can get solar panels sort of back of handset size. And there are three or four models already on the market. I can think of Comtiva as one example. They're typically retailing at between $35 and $40. They are on the backs of the particular, of the, of the low end handsets in particular. And mobile operators are absolutely buying them. Um, they're buying them to sell on to their consumers because they see the huge potential there. Um, obviously, there's a lot of lost revenue when people want to make a call, but they just don't have any power. Um, and the strategy to engage high net worth individuals in connectivity. I love. Let's speak later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're coming towards the end. We have to be absolutely out of here by 8 o'clock, but I think we've got time for another couple of questions or comments, if there's still an appetite for it. You've already had one go, but there's no one <laughs> uh, Over here first, and then... Hi, sorry, my name's Jack Hardy. Just a quick, brief question. Um, Dawn, you said briefly the, um, that 9 out of 10 women feel safer with a mobile phone. Could this be uh, the rise in communication? Could it be uh, harmful to the emergency services as well? Is that um, something? Sorry, could you just say the last bit again? I think Sorry, is, could, that, could the rise in communication with mobile phones be harmful to the emergency services in that respect? If they will feel safer, then the, kind of the demand on kind of health and police services could that be a problem? Um, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, from from my observation. In the developing world, emergency services don't really exist um, in the same way that they do. We did a big project around Lake Victoria, uh, bringing connectivity to the lake, and the big question was, okay, people can now make the phone call and say, I'm in a mess, but there was no one there to actually react to it. With that being said, in an extreme situation in Haiti after the earthquake, mobile phones and Ushahidi were being used to find earthquake survivors. Now, was that via kind of a local emergency response system? It was a combination of local emergency response, but also people who were based in the US. And so that concerted effort allowed them to find people and find survivors and using kind of the local mobile phone network. Thank you. Um, there was somebody else over the side here. Who had that hand up? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, just hear a bit more about engaging the uh, rural communities and strategies really from Dawn in terms of, of, of what you might have for the next five to ten years. And one very last quick one and then we'll go back to the panel. Maybe here, right next to you, thank you. Um, I'd really like to echo that um, because I haven't quite known how to frame my question. Um, but I, I've been involved with, with rural community development projects in Nigeria for 10 years. And I'm very interested in what you talk, say about the, the rollout you know, into the rural areas and also the problem of, of you know, people imposing solutions to their own questions and how we get two-way communication. And it, I was very struck um, just last week when I, I have three people who've now got smartphones in, in one particular area. Uh, but they can't afford to communicate with me. Now, you know, in, with friends in Kenya, it's easier because of safari, you know, and my, my mics and all this kind of thing. But um, in Nigeria, it's, it's a huge problem how I, I spend, send money to them to help them to pay. Because if I send them tiny bits of money, it's so expensive. If I send them a sensible chunk of money, it's ludicrous in their situation to say, I've given this to you to make phone calls to me. 
You know, it, it, it's just not comfortable. And what I desperately need to be able to do is to just say, I'll, I'll take the charge, you know, reverse, reverse charges, you know? That was what I would like to be able to do. You want to talk to me? You want to come online to discuss with me through the internet? You want to be on Yahoo for a while? Let me pay for the call. You've taken photos. You're willing to send them to me? Let me pay for the call. You've done video for me on your phone. You can't afford to send it to me. You know, it, it, it's so close now. Stuff that used to take me six, six weeks to get information back Back and forward. What can we do about it? <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to, um, with regret, stop stop the discussion there. Sorry to everybody whose hands I haven't managed to to, to, to uh, spot. And turn to the panel. Merit of being on the panel is that you get the last word. <laughs> and I'd like you to reflect on the rural urban divide, but also the wider access questions that each of you each of you touched upon. And we'll go in reverse order. Mm -hmm. so Dawn, you first. I would say that the, we see three big challenges with connecting the rural areas. Um, one is the power conundrum. Um, how do we get power into these areas? 1.6 billion people still live in areas where there is no electricity, and a further billion people live where they have inconsistent grid access. Second of all, literacy. Literacy tends to be lower in these areas, <clears throat> and therefore, that can be challenging with operating a handset and certainly limiting on SMS and other products and services, value-added services that mobile phones are now starting to deliver. And third of all, cost. Again, you know, three quarters of the world's poor live in rural areas. Um, th these particularly poor populations struggle to afford the cost of a handset and struggle to afford the cost of, um, of airtime. So that, that's my job to look at those three areas and uh, see how we can make improvements. Ken, you specifically mentioned the digital divide in your opening remarks. Yeah, I think uh, mobile is becoming such a huge topic and there's so much hype and excitement and so many things you can do. I think the first thing to do is actually think about what impact you can have or what bit you can do and what bit you can do well because you could spend your entire lives just spreading yourselves very, very thinly trying to solve all sorts of problems and, and maybe half solve them or, or even less. <laughs> less than that. For, for us, we don't get involved because we can't in the spread of mobile networks. That's for the private sector, for operators to do. But once the signal's there and once the phones are there, then we can be useful. Uh, and certainly when it comes to rural communities and helping foster communications in the, these places, we work very hard with our software and with NGOs once the infrastructure's in place and once the, the phones are in the hands of these people on $2 a day to help figure out what you can send them that's useful either through health or economic empowerment or human rights or whatever the actual challenges might be. If there's no mobile phone network, and I regularly get emails from, from NGOs saying, we'd love to use your software, but there's no mobile network in our village. Well, sorry, <laughs> I mean, we, we just can't do anything about that. You know, give us a call back when there is, um, or go and lobby your, your government. So that's where we step in at, at that point. And a final point on the, the, the sort of the airtime thing. Um, your, your friends could always just you know, ring you and hang up and flash you and beep you and all the different terminology that, that people use to describe that and you could ring them back and that way you would then, at least on a phone call, would actually carry the cost of that phone call. But there are websites and there are increasing numbers of people trying to figure out how airtime uh, can be transferred internationally and how you can top people's phones up and if you Google it you'll find a whole bunch of sites. Whether or not they'll be on the network that your friends are on, they might have to switch networks. But, but there are increasing numbers of sites that actually allow you to do that. Jenny, last word to you. Um, so I think, I think that maybe just I have three thoughts on this. The first, I just want to echo the idea of literacy. The fact that in some cases, while people who might not be able to read and write can use mobile phones, they can make or receive a call, they might be constrained in using some of these other mobile phone services and applications. So in Niger, more recently, kind of M-banking has come online. It's being used or piloted in certain areas. And what they've found is that certain people who are unable to read and write are having a really difficult time being able to use the service. And then there's the whole issue of kind of whether or not someone else could use their mobile phone on their behalf without them knowing it. And so I think that this is something that is really going to be a major issue uh, if we want these other applications and services to be of value. The second thing is that I think that you know there are obviously differences within each country. There are ethnic differences, there are sociological differences between urban and rural areas. There are very important differences as well. And I think that we have to be mindful of the fact that just because the technology exists doesn't necessarily mean that it's culturally appropriate for everyone within the society to use that mobile phone technology and then take that information and communication and translate it into action. And we need to be mindful of that while we're developing new applications and services, which kind of kind of mirrors what, what Ken said previously. A lot of these mobile phone applications and services exists. 
Um, the question is, how do you adapt them to the local context? You know, what do villages, what, what types of information do they need? What's the best way for them to get it in an easily usable form? And I think this is going to be, you know, the applications and the possibilities are endless. The question is, how can the public and the private sector work together in order for this to be useful for the populations who, who need it the most? Thank you very much. I think we could probably have carried on for another hour and a half, but unfortunately we don't have that time. So apologies again to any of you who didn't get a chance to make your remark or ask a question this evening.